So it's important to find out what your calling is and then work to making it happen. And don't wait for permission. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today, I'm excited to bring you an episode about creativity, spirituality, memes, and healing, and how they are all intertwined. Our special guest today is James McRae. James McRae, also known on Instagram as Words Are Vibrations, is an artist, poet, and teacher who empowers creators to live with purpose and turn imagination into reality. He is the founder of Sunflower Club, a global community dedicated to creativity as a tool for personal healing and social transformation. As a creative strategist, he has worked with top brands and startups to define and actualize their message and mission. His books include Shit Your Ego Says and How to Laugh in Ironic Amusement During Your Existential Crisis. James lives in Austin, Texas. Before we start the interview, I just want to announce that this is going to be the last episode of the season before we take a little summer break for the podcast. Thank you so much for listening to The Lavender Lifestyle so far, and please leave a review on Apple or Spotify if you've enjoyed it. So we'll be back with new episodes in the fall starting September 17th. So mark your calendars. We'll be back with a new episode that day. In the meantime, feel free to catch up on our older episodes if you haven't already, and wishing you an amazing summer. Love you guys. Hello, James. Welcome to the podcast. How are you feeling today? Hey, Eileen. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here and I'm feeling great. Uh, I got married just this past weekend. <gasps> oh my God, so congrats. A lot of newness and excitement in my life. And uh, so it's a, it's a really good time for me. Yeah, you must feel the love, right? Everyone gathering for you and like the it's like honeymoon phase. <laughs> yeah, very surreal. Very surreal to have friends and family from all walks of life gather together in the same place at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, it's like almost seems like a dream, you know, looking back and looking at the pictures and um it's such a f- beautiful fleeting moment to have everyone together. Definitely. At once. Yeah. So why don't you start by telling us your journey? Because I, I was saying before the recording, I admire your creativity. I, I admire this like fresh take you put on spirituality, consciousness, and you just have this lighthearted, fun vibe. So how, how did you come about this journey? Tell me about your creative and spiritual journey. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, for me, my creative journey and my spiritual journey are very much intertwined. Um, I very much consider my creative practice to, in a lot of ways, be my spiritual practice. So, you know, growing up, I was always an artist of various kinds, whether I was drawing or painting or writing poetry, drawing little comics of, uh, you know, my teacher or whatever it was. (laughs) And uh, I also had a really strong, I would say, spiritual foundation just because I was, you know, I grew up in a very small town in Minnesota. And so, the, you know, Christianity um, was very much the prevailing religion in that area uh, then and now. So even though I don't necessarily subscribe to that religion per se at the moment, it did give me a strong kind of spiritual grounding. And it kind of gave me a a sense of a relationship with the divine, so to speak. You know, whether you call that God, whether you call that the universe, whether you call that the divine, the mystery. um, I've always felt a connection to that source. Uh, And then as I I, uh, grew up, my creativity expanded and developed into different areas uh, as I found my my style and my voice, uh, I was a I worked in advertising as a graphic designer first, and then later as a brand strategist. And that career took me to New York City, and I, I worked on Madison Avenue doing doing brand strategy for clients for a number of years. Uh, and then it was then when I started to write and publish my own books. And then um, since then, I ended up in. Topanga for a year during the pandemic, 
uh, where I, where I kind of tapped into poetry again. I, I hadn't written poetry for a very long time, and you know, during that period of time, I, I tapped back into my poetry, um, and I also started making memes. And this was all kind of a way to make sense of the craziness of the world around us at at the you know in in twenty twenty and twenty one and those years. And then my second book came out uh, in twenty twenty one, and it's a book of poetry and memes, um, kind of about the upside down state of the world uh, that we live in. Um, and now I live in Austin, Texas, and um, and yeah, I teach uh, I teach creativity, and I'm working on more books and more memes, and uh, yeah, just exploring creativity uh, in all the ways, and often trying to communicate certain, you could call it spiritual or existential musings or insights through my writing and through my my memes and through my art. That's amazing. Let's go back to your first book. So you're saying you wrote, wrote your first book before you started your Instagram page? That's right. Yeah. So what gave you the confidence to write that book? And tell me about, I mean, what led to that book? What made you want to be like, oh, I want to write a book? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I, this was definitely before I had any audience um, or, you know, Instagram um, fame, you know, in any way whatsoever. I always wanted to write books. I always kind of felt like I would write books. Like I always really resonated with authors and poets and writers. So I felt like deep down I would always write books, but I never knew what the books would be, when I would write them, how I would write them. But I was always thinking about book ideas. And my first book was called Shit Your Ego Says. And this came about after I moved from Minnesota to New York City. And that's a pretty big um, jump to take when you don't have any like connections or like a lot of money and things like that. Because I, again, I grew up in a very small town and it wasn't definitely not common for people where I grew up to visit New York City, let alone move <laughs> to New York City. So it, it took a lot of courage and a, a big leap of faith to, to make that jump. And uh, and, I, and I, I had a quote in the back of my mind that I read in The Alchemist from Paulo Coelho, which said something about when you, when you really put your mind to something and, and you really align yourself with something, the universe will conspire for it to happen. So I, was, I, I kind of had that in the back of my head moving to New York. And then when I arrived, it was a challenge uh, just to get my footing, to find a place to live, to find a place to work. I was really struggling. And then, this was 2012, shortly after I arrived, the biggest storm in New York City history, Hurricane Sandy, happened and destroyed the apartment I was living in, and I was left <gasps> <Wow>. homeless. <laughs> oh right. my gosh. So, wow. I just, I felt, I was completely devastated. And you didn't and have I, a job, right? You were just young, <laughs> yeah, figuring it correct. out, and then this devastation, wow. I was applying for jobs and no one was hiring me. <laughs> so I was already <laughs> struggling to make to to find my my grounding and then I my apartment was yeah. destroyed. Oh so gosh. I ended up I didn't know I didn't really have a place to live and and my friend who um we were roommates so we we were both out of an apartment. Um he knew of a friend in this small island in the in the Caribbean called Culebra where he had this little uh beach um, cottage that was empty. And my friend was like, well, we can go stay in this like a <laughs> cottage in this little island called Culebra. So I did that and really just sat at the ocean all day and watched the tide go in and out and really just had days and days of extended meditation. And what I, what I realized was I felt these voices going on inside my head. And one of the voices was like telling me that I was a failure, that I should never have moved to New York City, that I should just go back home to Minnesota. This was all just a you know, misguided ambition. And I realized that, that was the voice of my ego. And then I had another voice that was softer and it was reassuring and it was telling me that all of this was happening for a reason and that I was on the path and this was part of my path. And I realized that this was the voice of my intuition or even my higher self. Um, and then it was in that moment that I realized like, oh, I'm going to write a book called Shit Your Ego Says. And it's going to be about the, 
the voices that are inside of our heads from the ego and the higher self and how to, how to tell the difference and which voice to listen to. Um, so that was where the idea of the first book came about. And then I just got really lucky. I mean, I guess Paulo Coelho was right when the, when you, the universe will conspire to support you when you are aligned. So it was sh- shortly after I started writing the book that really by such good fortune, uh, Hay House reached out to me and um, through a series of serendipitous events, they decided to publish it, um, which really allowed me to launch my career as, a, as an author and then, and then start building up my Instagram and, and things like that. So that was essentially like your first big break then. Would you consider that the big break? I would say so, yeah, because I went from uh-huh. you know absolutely no chance of getting a book deal, right, and then yeah. <laughs> being you know and then Hay unpo- House, it's like perfect, unemployed, yeah, unemployed and homeless, and then Hay House just essentially discovers my um, proposal, and then they yeah, and then they decided to publish it. So yeah, without that, I mean that that was just such a blessing at that time, and um, yeah, I'm very grateful for that experience. Wow. I love that story. Thanks for sharing. It's it's like a true, like he went to the depths and then he went on a spiritual, you know what I mean? It, it's it's a whole journey yeah, that you went on. What I perceived, what, you know, being stranded on that island, I, I perceived it to be the worst thing that ever happened to me, right? Because it, it on the surface, it looked like it was just a, a, a mistake and a failure. But in hindsight, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because it gave me the opportunity to surrender to the unknown mm. and to ultimately write a book about it. So yeah, yeah what, what we perceive as our struggles and our challenges actually end up propelling us forward. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so tell me the story of how and why you began creating for Instagram. Was it what was the reasoning or the inspiration behind it? Yeah, so prior to my book coming out, I used Instagram just as my personal account. You know, I would just post pictures of my, you know, me and my friends and things like that, maybe travel pictures. But the, then I recognized that, you know, people were really starting to use it more and more. It was becoming more of the it was kind of surpassing Facebook as the primary social media account of millennials you know, at that time. So I knew it was an important platform and I started to see other artists using it in other ways, whether they're doing, I guess that was this before video, but there was other artists who would share their art or their writing. So I would start to see creative ways of using the platform. So I just started to think about, well, how can I use this in a way that's really unique to me? Right. Cause like I'm not necessarily like Mr. Public Speaker or Mr. Motivational Speaker kind of guy, like where I'm going to do like motivational videos and things like that. So I really wanted to think about how can I do this in a way that is unique to me, that expresses my voice in an authentic way. And I thought, what do I really love doing? Cause it's like, if you don't love doing something, you're probably not going to succeed at it because you're not going to dedicate. Um, yourself to it in the way that you would dedicate to something you really love. So I think it's important to f- approach social media by finding a way that we really can have fun with it and 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 bring our own essence to it. So at the, t- the my first idea was I love to draw. Like I used to be more of a visual artist. I used to do a lot of doodling and sketching, um, and even painting. So I thought, how can I bring drawing into my Instagram? when I'm also writing this book about the ego and I'm talking about spiritual topics. So I started to just draw these little like characters, like little simple little cartoons that would have like a little, a little message or an insight. And looking back now, now that I make memes so much, I can look back and see that these were my prototypes for my memes, but I would just use little yeah. stick figures and they may, may be having a conversation. Um, and I just started to get back into drawing and use that as a way to express ideas. And then also maybe um, get back into poetry a little bit and then share, you know, short poems on, on Instagram. And then eventually now that they have video, I, I, that was the biggest challenge for me. I'm not super comfortable on camera. So 
that was the biggest challenge is is learning to find my footing with with video and with reels and uh that was a great growth opportunity because i i tried some things some of the, some of it worked some of it didn't but ultimately it was just about getting comfortable on camera getting comfortable putting your face and your voice out there so now that i've done that been doing that for a while i feel much more comfortable doing it and then memes were really the biggest um, boost for me is just when I really started to tap into the art form of memes, which is kind of like the native language of social media in so many ways. And that's when my account really started to blow up is when I started to develop memes and post them quite frequently. And that just um, in the past few years has been the biggest um you know, just opportunity for my account to grow is because I realized that you, with memes, you could make things that people wanted to share. And then when people share it, more people see it. And it was just kind of a domino effect um, since I started really diving in and, and committing to making memes. Yeah. So were you just essentially exploring in the beginning until you kind of found like what was working? Absolutely. I would try a lot of different things. Like just whether it's drawing or writing or, um, yeah, sharing pieces of my life, uh, pieces of my, you know, little, little uh, snippets from my book. Um, yeah, I tried a lot of different things. I mean, you can go back. It's, I love to like scroll back in my own feed and you can see all the different styles that yeah. I used. Or like, oh, I was really using like, red and white for a while and like my colors were red and white and then you can see like oh but then when i moved to la they started to get brighter and getting more like some pinks <laughs> and some blues and some greens and um for me it's always evolving you know i think that you know i think the best social media content is really authentic to the person creating it and you know we're always in the state of becoming and we're always in the state of growing so I'm really big on just because something worked last year doesn't mean it's going to work this year. So I'd rather check in with myself and say, well, where am I today? How do I feel like expressing myself today? And then even if that means abandoning or shedding my old skin to allow for new growth, um, I'm really big on that. I think artists are always reinventing themselves. And this includes social media artists and content creators. Uh, I think it's important just to move on when things are no longer feeling aligned and then moving into new territory, even if it's uncomfortable. Yeah, it can always be scary, like trying something new because you never know if it's going to work the same way something else has. But as an artist, you always have to be evolving and you always have to kind of challenge yourself, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, if I look, when I'm looking looking back, like at first even, it was very much like, I, you know, with, with the Hay House book, Deal, you know, that that kind of positioned me as being like, oh, I'm a self help author. And then during the pandemic, when I started writing poetry, I kind of had to shed that identity. And like, mm. oh, like, I just don't feel like being like a motivational speaker or like, I'd rather just be an artist and like write and like share my art and share my poetry and, and not be inspirational sometimes or, or educational, but maybe even be just express my shadow or like things like that. So, um, yeah, even when you're, even when you have like a platform or you have a certain, like a following or people expect certain things from you, it's so important to, to break those expectations when they no longer align, you know, and I, and I grew up, you know, following mm -hmm. artists and like, and like seeing artists like Pablo Picasso, who would every few years, he would really reinvent himself as an artist. And though, and, or, or like one of my favorite musicians is Bob Dylan and the same with him is he would reinvent himself every few years. And, um, he, you could never really pin him down because he was always letting his art grow and evolve with him. Um, so I, that's what what I've tried to do with my own, you know, social media account. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about creating memes cuz memes like I think it's just a medium that is so instantly like accessible. People instantly love it, they share it and but I'm sure the process of creating one is not as easy as it seems. It takes it's like you're combining different 
I don't know, parts of your brain. I, I've always, I, I'm not the kind of person that's good at memes. Um, but it, yeah, it, it's just so interesting to me. So tell us about your process, that creative process. Yeah, it's funny because it really combines a lot of the things I've been doing for a long time. Like if you look, um, you know, one of the things for making memes is graphic design. And you don't have to be a great graphic designer. In fact, the best memes are very simple. But I think it does help to know how to use, how to manipulate digital Im imagery to a degree. Whether that's with an app or with Photoshop. Um so the fact that I went to college for graphic design, I had an understanding of how to use these applications. Even though I was kind of out of practice, when I, when I started making memes, I was using just like my phone for different apps. And I'm like, wait a minute, I know Photoshop. And that gave me a whole new, it's like a whole new like a toolkit to actually create the, the graphics and the typography and things like that. But most importantly, I think it's not just the design of the meme, it's, it's like the message of the meme. So what makes a meme successful, let's say, is that it strikes a chord with the collective. So for me, it's really important just to have my finger on the pulse of the collective mood swings that we're in as a society. So for me, you know, that starts with and this is for creativity in general. For me, it starts with just tuning into my body to see how I'm feeling and what I'm noticing about you know, the world. Or is there a certain message that's trying to come through me? Or is there a certain message that I feel people need at this time? Because um, I feel like on an energetic and emotional level, like all people are connected. So when, I, when you tune into your own emotions and your energy, you're actually tuning into something that maybe we a shared sensation. So that's the most important thing with memes mm -hmm. is just um, having a message that really strikes a chord. Um, and you get there, I think, by, by checking in and kind of going within. So I usually start with like a note, in a notebook and I just kind of see what, what messages I'm feeling. And that, that might come out with a meme, that might come out with a poem. It's hard to predict like where that creative energy will flow. And for a meme, the image is so important. Sometimes I start with the image and then I try to think of a caption for it. And sometimes I'll just, like I said, like kind of download creative ideas and see what comes through. And then, and then I, if something I think might work for a meme, then I'll go and search for an image that will work. And I save a lot of images, like when I'm browsing the internet and when I'm on social media, I'm always... Do you have like a trick of like finding the right image? That must be, you're just searching the internet in general, right? You've got to be, you've got to spend a lot of time on <laughs> online. And like, that's not always the best thing to say, right? Because spending a lot of time online is, um, you know, is not good for you necessarily. But when you use social media as a kind of a research tool, then you're being pr like, it's more productive and it's more like, it's, it's more of a healthy use case. Like I, I might be on social media a lot, but I'm either looking for inspiration or I'm posting stuff and I'm using it as my art studio, not just mindlessly mm -hmm. scrolling, right? Because if I, if I, if, if I come yeah. across an image that captures me, I'm like, oh, take, I'm taking that. Or I might get an idea for something yeah. and, I'll write, and I'll write it down in my notes app. So I'm always kind of researching. And I'm always, I, I, have a pin, I have a Pinterest board with hundreds and hundreds of potential um, images for memes. I see. It's a library. So you know how to access it if you need it. Totally. Right. So in that they might come, from, yeah, it's just, I'm usually just taking screenshots or finding images that, that, that's, that resonate with me. And then I might, like I said, I'll either get the idea first and then I'll go hunt for an image or I'll find an image. And I'm like, I really want to make this into a meme. And then I'll just look at the image and just kind of, just kind of meditate, just kind of contemplate, like, what is this image saying? How can mm -hmm. I express my voice through this image and just sit with that and see what comes out? I don't really force it. Sometimes I might sit there and be like, what is this image trying to say? And, and half an hour might go by and like, I don't have any ideas. And then I just let it be. Then it's, maybe I'll come back to it later. But usually I'll get some ideas and I'll be like, okay, I like this direction. And then I'll just, you know, write something out on, in a notebook. Uh, and then I usually go into Photoshop later and like, you know, put it all together 
and like make do a nice little polished final version. How much time in your week are you spending on this creative process for creating online content? Because it sounds like it can take a long time and it's like as a creative and, and because you you work on so many different projects, how, what does that look like with your time? Yeah. Well, it's, it's honestly my favorite thing to do. So I spend <laughs> as much time as I can doing it. And that's, like I said, if you really yeah. want to create amazing content, you got to find a way to do it in a way that you really have fun doing it. Because for me, that's fun. If I, if I have got some time to just like make some memes, I'm happy because I'm happy when I create. Yeah. And, and for me, um, memes are like some of the easiest things that I create because, you know, writing a book takes so long and it takes so long to get it written and takes so long to publish it. A poem is kind of middle of the road, but it's like hard to share a poem online. So if I write a poem, I might get a chance to read it out loud and that's, that's fun, but it's just, um, I don't get as many opportunities but with social media content, I can share it every day. So it's really fun just to be, be in that process of creation and then also sharing and then getting feedback and just that yeah. back and forth with my audience. So I really like doing it. I, I usually, so for me, the, the mornings are the most conducive time for creativity because I feel like once I get kind of too distracted by meetings or obligations or making lunch or whatever it is, it's it's hard to go back into that that open channel that allows creative ideas to flow. So I try to keep my mornings open for just creativity. And whatever I'm working on, just give myself at least three or four hours to work on it. And if I'm writing a book, it, that might be, you know, that might go to writing the book. Or if I'm work, working on a new online class, that might go to work to creating the online class. But memes are ki- and little pieces of writing are kind of my. If I don't have a big project, I just pour that time into making memes. And um, like I said, because it's not for me. It's it's, it's 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 not marketing. It's just more creating art. So it's for me. It's just really fun to do. I think that's why your work resonates because you're genuinely having fun doing it. Like people feel the emotion that went into creating it. <laughs> you're not doing it because you have to. Because. I mean, personally, as a content creator, sometimes you do feel that like pressure. Oh, I have to make something, but I don't know what to make. Do you ever have that like creative block? And when it doesn't feel fun, what do you do in that case? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of always afraid I'm going to run out of ideas, honestly. <laughs> like maybe that's why I create so compulsively because I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to do it forever. But that never happens. Like I think it's important for artists and for people of all kinds to give themselves permission and space to rest and not to force it. Cause there are certain days when like, I'm just not feeling it and like nothing's coming. And I just need to just, for me, it's more important to show up even if nothing is created that day. Or like if I'm working on my, on, 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 on a book and like, there might be a day where I get, one paragraph written, but that's enough just to, it's enough mm-hmm. just to show up and give yourself more like yeah. chances at bat to hit the ball. Right. But you can't be frustrated if like you don't hit the ball that day. So yeah, it's all for me. It's like, it's kind of like, um, the act of creation is almost like purging something or it's like, it's like a, it's like a cleanse where like if something needs to come out, I'm going to feel it and then I'm going to, I'm going to guide it to come out. You know, it's almost like uh, releasing toxins from the body. Like, like you're, you're like, a, like you're purging or you're sweating or you're, um, there's kind of a release that happens. So sometimes if I don't feel anything that needs to be released, I'll just be okay with that. And then maybe I'll do some reading instead. So I don't force it. If mm-hmm. nothing's coming that day, uh, I just let that be and, you know, I'll find something else to do. Um, but as long as I keep showing up consistently and, and cause I think like, I like to think that there's a relationship that creatives have with the muse. Um, because when you think about where ideas come from, you know, you're, I feel like you're, we're really tapping into another dimension, like our imagination and our intuition. These are portals that give us access to, in a lot of ways, like another dimension. And this is where, you know, the muse lives. And I feel like, 
the muse will give us her secrets as long as we prove to her that we are dedicated and committed and that we are worthy receivers of her insights. So I feel like when you show up and make it consistent and make it a habit, the muse is more likely to whisper her beautiful secrets into your ear. <laughs> yeah. I I think I read that some did you read Elizabeth Gilbert Big Magic? I think yeah, she I talks book. about that. Yeah, yeah, she talks about that as well as like you have to show up and it's like it's not always going to come to you, but it, it's something you can't control, but all all you can control is just showing up, right? Um what other tips or advice do you have for creatives? Because a lot of people struggle with maybe well, I don't know. There's just so many like self-sabotage, self-doubt. It's just everything a creative goes through in their mind. I'm sure you've gone through the same exact thing. So what advice do you have for people? So there's a lot of things I would say. One of the first things that comes to mind is that get over the idea of perfectionism. Like I love this quote from the jazz musician, Miles Davis. He said, do not fear mistakes. There are none. He said, there's, when you're playing jazz, you can't play the wrong note because it, the note you play doesn't matter. It's about the note that you play after that note. So even if you hit the wrong note, when you follow that up with a different note, it just becomes something different. So the creative process is very much like jazz music in that it is very spontaneous and it's happening in the moment. And it's about just channeling that energy as it's coming through. And it's not going to be perfect. And perfection is not the point. The best art has something that's a little bit rougher around the, around the edges, or it reveals something true about the, the creator. And if something is overly engineered or overly analytical or overly processed, it might not have that same infectious spirit. So I think that in a way, like all creativity, all art is improvisation. Even if I'm at home alone making a meme, that idea still comes through in a spontaneous way and I write it down in a way that is very much improv. I'm making it up as I go. I don't know the ending of the meme before when the idea comes. I've got to take the idea and dance with it and see where I can go with it. And there's no predefined way to do that. It's about having awareness in the present moment to work with that energy. So don't worry about perfectionism. Don't worry about making, mis making a mistake. I also love stand-up comedy. And the thing with becoming a good stand-up comic is that there's no way you can go on stage for the first time and be a great stand-up comic. It's not possible because it's not about being smart or writing a great joke, it's about being comfortable enough on stage to deliver it in a way that's going to impact and holding space and make, having a relationship with that audience. And you can only do that through repetition, through practice, through habits. So it's just showing up and just trying and failing and trying and failing. And it's not failure because it's actually helping you step forward. So embrace your mistakes, embrace the messiness of the process, right? And don't worry too much about perfection. Um, that's one of the main things I would say. And just trusting your own intuition, like trusting your inner, your inner voice and your inner vision. And, you know, if something is trying to come through you, if you have an idea that you want to express, that's not an accident. I think that idea is using you as a vessel to get out into the world. So trust your intuition, trust your insight, and just try to be a, a reliable midwife to bring those ideas into the world. Yeah, totally. Love it. Even the perfectionism thing, like, like I can total, I feel like you're speaking to my soul because these are the things I struggle with, like how to not judge your work, how to not feel like you know, sometimes you create something and you want it to be so good and you care so much about it. How did you personally overcome like not caring about perfectionism? Well, you know, so much of my favorite art is is a little bit messy, right? Like I just love, you know, even whether that's like um, 
you like punk rock or like a freestyle rapper mm-hmm. or like the paintings yeah. of, of, of Jean-Michel Basquiat, which are just really messy and kind of like childlike scribbles and doodles. Um, and there's a living energy to that. So you don't want to suck the life out of something by overly engineering it. So when my book first came out, my first book, I started being invited onto podcasts. And my first couple podcasts, I was very nervous. And I was trying too hard to be perfect. So I've experienced that. I remember I had like notes laid out in front of my desk so I could like read my notes during the interview. And I just remember how that felt. It felt really uptight. I was I had I drank too much coffee. I was just a little bit unnerved. And I was like, look at my notes. And I just knew that I came across as forcing it or like trying too hard to achieve what I thought people wanted. Cause I remember like I listened to like one podcast with like Tony Robbins and he was coming in with like, here's my three step technique for X, Y, and Z. And they were coming in with all these like very like formulaic things. And I thought, I thought I needed to be that. So that's why I was coming in with my notes so I could, you know, sound like as confident as Tony Robbins. And it was just, (laughs) it was really just a disaster. And I realized I didn't want to do that again. And I realized if I was going to keep doing podcasts, I wanted to just speak from the heart and like let the same way in my creative process, if I'm writing a book, I just trust whatever comes through. And I just try to communicate that, I'm like, okay, I need to do this with podcasts too. So I started, instead of looking at notes before a podcast, I would just meditate before the podcast just to clear my mind and open that channel. And then I realized that going in there with no preparation, it was more fun. It was more natural. It was more spontaneous, um, which just enabled, you know, a a more easeful conversation. So there's been a lot of trial and error. And I just think that you can't worry your whole life. You know, you can't just walk through life worrying about the outcome of things. You kind of have to trust the moment and just be present and let the moment unfold as it will and not hold yourself to external expectations and standards. Um, It's more just about trying to express the authenticity of yourself and your message. And that's going to land perfectly however however it lands. Um, And that's all within us is unique to us all. So just trusting ourselves is the best way to do it. It's like learning how to freestyle dance with life. And the, the more you practice, the better you get, right? Because more most people are terrified, can't don't even know what to do if they have to freestyle. They're used to, oh, let me practice it. Let me choreograph it. Let me plan it out, <laughs> all the steps. A million percent. Yeah. I, I love that you've been able to achieve that flow. Yeah. Being comfortable with uncertainty is just one of the greatest lessons that I've learned. And that applies both to whether it's spirituality or creativity, just being comfortable not knowing and and being in a state of becoming rather than thinking you've already arrived because it's all it's all fluid it's all spontaneous and i just try to to trust that dance wherever it goes yep so it sounds like you enjoy meditating are there other things that you do in your routine to cut, you know stay connected to your to the divine your inspiration yeah, um, I've I've meditated every morning for a long time, and for me, I just meditate just about like ten minutes every morning, nothing too crazy. But I've also gone through periods where I meditated for much longer. Um, I w- I was trained as a Kundalini yogi, and so there was a lot of deep meditation and yoga practices that we would do and where I'd meditate for, you know, three hours at a time, four hours at a time. So I think I can get away with just doing 10 minutes now because I do have a lot of training in that area and I've meditated for, you know, um, long periods of time. Um, I would say breath work is another one. Um, Breath work is a good practice to go back to. Um, It's almost like meditation plus like you're getting the you know the focus 
the focused consciousness, but you're also getting the the somatic kind of um, exercise as well. Um, spending time with nature in nature, whether it's running, walking my dogs, um, things like that. Uh, and also just consuming art. I think it's really important for artists to stay inspired. So whether that's reading books or watching documentaries or um, listening to new albums that, that come out, I'm always seeking out inspiration uh, through other through other artists. And I'm not a musician, right? But I'm always inspired by by musicians. And I'm not really a painter, but I love going to museums and being inspired by the art. So I, I think it's important just because you work in one area, I think it's important to like seek out inspiration, you know, in a lot of other areas. Um, so yeah, just staying inspired and staying healthy and e- eating a clean diet and just trying to keep be an open channel as much as I can. Yeah. Since you have such a strong background in like Kundalini and meditating, what tips do you have for our listeners who maybe they're just basic beginner meditation meditators, right? What, what, how do you meditate even if it's 10 minutes? Yeah. Well, I love the saying that there's no wrong way to meditate. You know, the most basic form of meditation that I do is really the simplest kind. You could just call it a mindfulness meditation. And it's really about sitting down in a comfortable position, having a straight spine, you know, posture is important. So just sitting up straight in a comfortable position, nothing too crazy, and just close your eyes and try to focus on your breath. That's it. You can't really mess it up. You know, even if you have thoughts, and I do have thoughts when I meditate, you know, they, they, they come in and you just kind of acknowledge them and then you just try to bring your awareness back to the breath. And even if 10 minutes goes by and you're like, oh, I couldn't stop worrying about about this or that, it still was beneficial because it's still, you still showed up and and you did it. And then maybe next time you'll be in, in a better position to do it. It's kind of getting comfortable and you know, it takes a while to slow down the busy mind. You know, I, I, I learned that that's why I had to do Kundalini because I was living in New York City, working in advertising. I just had a million intrusive thoughts every day. You know, that's why I, write, I wrote a book called Shit Your Ego Says because I know how the mind, you know, um, can... I think we the average person thinks something like 50,000 thoughts every single day. And most of these thoughts are just, you know... Um, just kind of useless or intrusive or you know negative or random and it's just important not to take these thoughts too seriously like if you have a worry or if you have um, a fear or you have other just like it's just mental clutter so i meditation at least for me has taught me not to identify with my thoughts too too much because at the end of the day, we are not our thoughts. The mind is just racing a million miles a minute and it has all, it's processing information and that's all fine. There's nothing wrong with thinking, but we are not our thoughts. And just because you think something doesn't make it true. So meditation for me is just the process of observing your thoughts and being the observer of them as opposed to identify as I am my thoughts. So I just sit there and and try and you know try to focus on my breath and 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 let that be my practice and it's it's fairly simple. And then if you wanted to bring in a little bit of breath work, I breath of fire is the most kind of tried and true breath work technique in kundalini and it's very simple. You just kind of put your mouth into a little bit of a, an O shape and you just do rapid breathing through your mouth in and out. So it kind of looks and sounds like this. <laughs> And that's like a breathwork espresso shot. Like if you're going to go and... To how a long meeting, do you do I, that for? Um, it, how, however long you have. When I was working in advertising, okay. I used to do it before a meeting. I would go... I'd wow. be in an elevator. I'd be in an elevator going to see a client. And I would just do breath of fire while I was in the elevator. Just to kind of get my nervous system um, ready for that meeting. Or I'll do the I'll do it before a podcast. So... Sometimes in Kundalini, we would do it for like 11 minutes. But if you have two minutes to do it, it will really reset your nervous system. Mm. And you said it energizes you like espresso? 
yeah, it's like the espresso shot of of breath work because it 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 packs a, a punch. It'll it'll just kind of revitalize you in in only a matter of minutes. Yeah. So interesting. Okay, so there's so many things I could ask you about, but I'm gonna ask you this because I. I'm sure you notice how the world, everyone is becoming more conscious. Everyone's becoming more aware of spirituality and all these topics that you talk about. Um, And and I feel like you've known, you've been in this for, for, for a long time. What role do you hope to play in this movement? And where do you hope to see our future moving towards? First of all, yes, I do. I do definitely see that. I definitely see there being a bit of a awakening of consciousness. And it's beautiful to see. Um, I think people are more open to, you know, whether it's simple things like yoga or meditation. Um, There's obviously a big trend in terms of things like plant medicine and using that as a, you know, an area to expand your consciousness. Yeah, I see a lot of that. uh, And I think it's just so important to... You know, one of the biggest shifts that in in my life of the past couple of years is going from kind of being going from being an artist to being a teacher. And I just think it's so important to be in a position to to help others, right? Because we're all in this together. And I think, you know, there used to be this trend in art where it was kind of like this expression of a of a single genius and like look at this genius in his art and, or her her art and i think now like what the what what the world needs is teachers healers helpers people that can apply their creativity and their genius and their talents to making the world a better place and healing each other and healing mm-hmm. the world and healing our social structures so that's what i really hope to see is every kind of like all hands on deck like wh- mm-hmm. where are you called to serve like we all are called to serve in different ways and my calling is not your calling and your calling is not my calling. So it's important to find out what your calling is and then work to making it happen. And don't wait for permission. Like the, 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 you know, the, the institutions that we seek validation from, whether that's, you know, Oh, being a published author or having a, uh, a show on Netflix or, Whatever it is, like, I think that we need to start doing the work in our communities, wherever it is, and applying our purpose and our dharma to our everyday lives and having an impact on the community around us. So that's what I th- that's that's where I hope to see the world going. And for me, when it comes to creativity, that's what I want to do is have an impact in communities. Because I feel like creativity is a human necessity. Because I feel like there are a lot of ways to, um, there are a lot of healing modalities out there, you know, whether that's yoga or breath work or meditation or other spiritual practices. And I think that creativity can, can be that. Creativity can be a healing modality, can be a spiritual practice. Because if you think, if you think about how it works, like I've, it's, it's kind of the same when you, um, if you suppress an emotion or you um, suppress a, a traumatic memory and you push it down, that's eventually over time going to, to fester and even atrophy into sickness. So you need, to, you need to shed light on it and kind of get it out and you need to purge it. And I feel like creativity is one modality to, to, to purge where you can you know, um, write something down and then explore your shadow in a way, and then you share it. And there's a release that happens when you do that. Um, so I host, uh, I host a monthly uh, creativity ceremony uh, where I live here in Austin, Texas called Sunflower Club, which is just that. It's, a, it's essentially a creativity gathering based on healing or creativity as a healing modality. So I want to bring creativity to more people and like make creative expression accessible to people. So not just the famous artists and the published authors are allowed to be creative. We all can be creative. Um, so 
Um, there's already been a few other sunflower clubs that have sprouted up around the world because I've, I've created the, um, the guidelines for how to host your own. So, um, so we've had sunflower clubs in places like New Zealand, um, Colorado, Florida, Canada. Um, so I really hope to get sunflower clubs into cities all over the world um, so we can bring the healing power of creative expression to everyone. That's so beautiful. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about Sunflower Club. Um, just, just to give us an example, what kind of expressions happen at Sunflower Club in a given night? So I try to keep it open because um, I feel like everyone expresses in their own way. Not everyone identifies as being a yeah. poet. So I want to make sure mm -hmm. it's um, open because there are, there are um, I've been to poetry open mics and those are great and a lot of the shares at Sunflower Club are poetry, but I want to keep it open for other modes of expression because everyone is different. So it's really open format. It's like go to the stage and whatever you have to share, you 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 have you know whatever five to ten minutes to share. Um, and I don't have any rules around it other than whatever you want to share. That this this time is yours, and we're here to witness you. So it tends to be poetry. You know, I realized very quickly that Austin is such an amazing musical city that we get a lot of uh, musicians and singers. So I love that as well. Um, we've had a little bit of comedy. We've had a little bit of dancing. Um, so I love those, you know, uh, other modalities that people share. And my, and my absolute favorite, and this happens maybe once every night when I do it, is when someone does not know what they're going to say, they just they just go to the stage <laughs> and they and they and they share freely whatever is on their hearts. Wow! And for me, that's mm. the most courageous, right? Because it's about yeah, it's really vulnerable to do that, and um, it's just always beautiful to witness. Um, so yeah, just we don't judge. You know, it's not. I, I say very specifically, this is not a talent show. We're not here to showcase our talent although there are talented people it just it, it's 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 more of a sharing ceremony so we're here to receive each other regardless of what it is because i believe that it's not about being good at creativity it's about creativity being good for you wow that's amazing i thank you for creating a space like that cuz it's i love what you said earlier going back to what you said like everybody it, like creativity is for everybody. It's a necessity for all humans. And I, people usually put creativity in a box. Oh, it's just for these artists or these gifted, talented people. But it's true. Creativity can bring so much healing. And I think there was a time, maybe when we were growing up, that art was just put in a box. Like it wasn't useful. It was just pretty, right? But now more and more, I see that the the real purpose for art is it's it's a way to heal people it's a it's a way to bring message like whatever message you want to a greater mass of people and there's so much power in that so we need artists more than anything right now as the world is changing and evolving yeah i think so you know i think that when you look at the world um there are a lot of problems in the world obviously and these are problems that we don't always have solutions for so we need creative thinking um, to be applied to some of these problems, you know? So I think that as, as the world gets more uncertain, creativity is more important than ever because we don't have the same default answers to fall back on. We need new answers and new solutions for these new problems. Um, so I feel like create, and especially if you look at things like AI and like how things can be so easily automated you know, right now, and we're just at the, at the beginning of that. Um, I think that just puts um, an even more in, of an emphasis on creativity and and creative thinking because these are that's something that you know. I, I think AI is more of a, a a tool for creatives to use. I don't think AI can actually be creative. It's only can feed out data, you know, take in data and and put out data. So I think it's a great tool for artists to use, but it's going to put even more of an emphasis on the importance of human creativity as, as, as we find our, our own role as humans in a, in an AI world. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing can replicate like that, 
the invisible connection you have as an artist, right? We, as a channel. <laughs> so there, I think there will always be a place for human creativity. So James, what are you excited about next? Well, so much. I mean, I'm excited for, um, you know, for summer to come. It's, um, we're recording this in May. So that's, that's a fun time of year. Um, in my personal life, I am putting the final, 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 final copy edits on my next book, Ooh. which is called The Art of You, The Essential Guidebook to Reclaiming Your Creativity. And, mm. uh, Coming out with Sounds True in early 2024. So keep your eyes open. And it's essentially the blueprint for the creative process. Um, and it mm, breaks down nice. the creative process into two main categories, the yin and the yang. And um, so the yin are going to be things like cultivating your intuition and slowing down and learning to listen and to use your imagination, and um, to find inspiration, more of the spiritual aspects of the creative process. And then yang is more the doing, the action, the making, developing your style, developing a practice, showing up consistently, launching your work, growing an audience, things like that. Um, so that's the main sections, yin and the yang, creative being and creative doing. and. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of art in it, and it's going to be a fun book. So that's that's um, I'm excited for that to come out uh, early 2024. Yeah, that's super exciting. I already love that concept, the, the yin and the yang, because you need to have that both, like the the intuitive slow stuff, and then the the actual doing. Um, okay, James, if you have one final message that you want to leave our audience with today, what would that be? Let's see what's coming through right at this moment. What's coming through, honestly, is just just trust yourself. Like where, wherever you're at is not an accident. You know, it, you may not like where your life is at, at, at this point in time, and that's fine. I've I've been there many times, um, but I've, I can all when I look back, I can always see how every moment in my life was necessary at that time to get me where I am today. So whether that's your creative path, your career path, wherever you are in your journey is the right place. Don't give up. It's not a mistake where you are at this moment in time. And trust yourself and be bold and take risks and be brave and put yourself out there. And there is um, strength in vulnerability because in vulnerability, we, we, we really have to be our true selves. and. Magic happens when we show up as our true selves. So trust yourself, be willing to be vulnerable, be willing to take risks. And um, ultimately, we're here and we're alive to, to grow and to experience. So don't, don't put yourself into a box. Live to your fullest expression and um, you'll be very happy that you did. Beautiful. Okay, James, where can we find you online? So my main uh, zone is going to be Instagram. You can find me at words are vibrations. And then in the link in my bio, you can find all the stuff. I have a meme school where I teach how to make memes. Um, I've got a podcast called Sunflower Club. And then I've got my two books available as well. So the link in my bio will show you all that good stuff. Amazing. And we'll link everything that we mentioned in the show notes. Thank you so much, James, for sharing your wisdom and all this information with us today. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. And I love your work as well. So keep on doing it. I love your style and your message. So um, it's, it's great to chat with you here today. Thank you. Thank you.